welcome everyone. I see um, friends from India, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia is already here, uh, Mongolia, India, and also Timor-Leste and Thailand. And yes, Myanmar is also here. Welcome. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to welcome you to this PMT course. Yeah, as you all know, last year we celebrated the 10th anniversary of SOCDEM in, uh, in uh, 2019. That was, that, was, that was really fantastic. And around that time, we also made kind of a little um, strategic shift uh, in the sense that we try to subsume or bundle most of the activities that FES is um, uh, sponsoring in our Academy for Progressive Politics. Um, and the idea being really that we focus on, on trainings and, uh, and, and the transfer of knowledge that enables you guys to think strategically. I think that's really important. And in most of the places, you, our friends, are in a rather difficult position to really uh, trying to change something for the better is to start thinking strategically. And for that, we have a couple of tools at FES that we developed. And, um, and those type of tools is what we try to convey through Academy of Progressive Politics. In the end, it will be basically to, uh, you know, to help us work on issues such as shrinking democratic spaces, climate change, human rights, global health and economic crisis uh, as it's related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And as you can see, those are all, those are all huge topics and uh, <laughs> they are very difficult to tackle. And so again, thinking and acting strategically is key. One thing that Macris already mentioned is that, um, that we're moving online in part due to uh, necessity, due to the COVID-19 situation and this is the first time we're having PMT in this format um, and what, what will happen in the in the near future is that we will offer a uh, an online learning platform uh, in which basically we will have uh, all types of interesting contents for you guys uh, to work on those big issues that I just mentioned so this should hopefully enable us to really um, uh, not only work more fit, more effectively in those difficult times, but also to you know that you guys can study not only during the uh, not only during the regular uh, PMT courses, but also in your everyday lives. Uh, I think young people are really in general uh, uh, striving to have more open societies, and this is something that we that we try to support. So you guys are really at the at the forefront of our efforts. And uh, the PMT course, especially in this online format, will hopefully help us to, uh, to get you guys equipped, better equipped to uh, fight for those very important issues. So thank you very much. Um, I wish you best of luck, a lot of interesting uh, insights during this PMT course. And uh, with that, I would like to say goodbye. Thank you to FES for being very supportive of uh, the Academy for Progressive Politics. The webinar today is a lesson under the Political Management Training for Young Progressives, Cluster One Ideology. We are happy to welcome today our speaker from Germany, a friend of SOCDEM Asia who has worked with us for many years. He is a member of the Social Democratic Party of Germany and is the Vice Chairman of the Party's Committee on Fundamental Principles. Welcome, Professor Thomas Meyer. Professor Meyer is a philosopher, a political scientist, a writer, a scholar, and a faculty member of the Academy for Social Democracy of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. A fun fact for our participants, Professor Meyer received a doctoral degree at Frankfurt for a dissertation about the role of the proletarian in Karl Marx's theory of liberation. Today, he will discuss with us the foundations and future of social democracy. Friends, let us welcome Professor Meyer, the author of the book, The Theory of Social Democracy. Willy Brandt, the great leader of social democracy, in Europe, but also worldwide, because he was the president of the Socialist International for about 20 years in the 1980s and 90s. When he hold his last speech 
in the Social Democratic Party meeting. He said, if I am asked to answer in one sentence and what is the most important thing for me, which value, which aim, which goal to be a social democrat, he said, then it is freedom, freedom. But freedom, this makes the difference to the liberals, to the conservatives and all other, freedom, equal freedom for all, freedom, same freedom for everybody. This is how you could put the aim, the substance of social democracy in one word. You see this here, this is a very, very brief definition of what social democracy is, and it is also part of the answer to the question, what makes the difference between social democracy and all the other ideologies, if you say. So you see social democracy is, we are for a just or a fair society. What is justice? Justice for us is nothing else but equal freedom for all, equal freedom for all. But the second substantial social democratic definition or composition of freedom is freedom. Freedom has two parts, which other ideologies do not see or do not accept. It has a negative part, Freedom means defense against intervention into my life sphere, against my life, against my body. Defense, negative, protection. We prevent other people from interfering into our realm of action, our life sphere. This is how the liberals define freedom, this negative. But this is not enough for us because if you are not wealthy, if you are born in a poor or in a not so wealthy family, if you are defended from interference into your life sphere, you still are not free because you do not have anything to act. Freedom means freedom of action, self-determined action. A free life is a life in which you determine how you want to live, what you want to do by yourself. So in order to do that, you need the negative component of freedom, protection against arbitrary intervention. But then again, you need something much more. And this is the special social democratic component of freedom. You need positive freedom, namely enabling capabilities. You need resources to act. You need income. You need education. You need participation capabilities or enabling resources. This is the positive part. And the social democratic concept of freedom is much about this positive component of freedom. Everybody must have income, must have social services, must have education to live a free life. And therefore, when the US sometimes say, we are the freest society in the world, this is right for the rich people because they don't need anything else but protection against interference by the state or by anybody else. But this is not enough. At the same time, millions there live on the streets or do not have proper education or do not have enough food or cannot go to a doctor when they are sick because they cannot pay the bill for this. And therefore, real freedom, real freedom, you could say, is composed of these two parts, negative and positive freedom. And only if the, these two parts come together, then it is what we understand when we say freedom. And then we say, if everybody in a society enjoys this freedom, composed of the two components, negative and positive, then as society is fair or just, this is the ultimate goal of social democracy. Nothing but this. Then we have also, of course, the concept, the concept of solidarity. For, for us, this is highly important also because we know that human beings are dependent from each other necessarily all the time. Then they have a basic duty to help each other, to respect each other. This is the third basic value, which we always mention. As, as Philip Brandt said, I support this absolutely. The most important thing is freedom, but in this social democratic sense of negative plus 
positive. So this would be the definition. Here I would say, if you look into the world of today, you have three competing ideologies that play a major role. You have neoliberalism in its social and economic dimension. It can also be called libertarianism. Libertarianism means everybody does what she or he wants without any state regulation, without any state responsibility. This is the way most of the conservatives in the United States understand it. They are libertarians. They are not liberals because we have here a different understanding of the words. When the, in the United States you say a liberal, they mean a social democrat, which is a little bit strange, but you should know this. And the, those whom we call the liberals in Europe, or the libertarians, you could say the radicals, the strong liberals, the libertarians, this is the conservatives in the United States. They mean the market alone, the individual alone should decide everything, keep the state out of our lives. This is the main topic in the United States, also in the elections, keep the state off our lives. This is libertarianism. This is one current, one ideology that plays a big role in the world, in different countries, US, Europe, and the international consequence of this is the best instrument to organize or to do globalization is market globalization. If the market dominates the world, then this means that we have a fair and free and profitable organization of the global situation. This is one thing. They are very powerful. Not all of these people say very clearly what they intend. But this is, uh, of course, something that is supported by the industrialists, by the big money, by the ruling elites everywhere in different worlds. But the substance is this. And sometimes they say, if the markets dominate globalization, it's very good. Then the left governments cannot spend too much money for social uh, obligations because it would mean that the uh, budgets get out of balance and then the markets will punish them. They write this even in their books. This is neoliberalism. And in the US, of course, the elections now are mainly a choice, a decision between neoliberalism or libertarianism and social democracy. Because now, under the influence of Bernie Sanders, uh, even Biden, who was not a social democrat, a staunch social democrat before, accepted a social democratic program like free university education, like better health services, and like many other things. This is one. It's there in each country, in each of your countries also, in Europe also. Hello, I'll say no system. Yeah? I'll say this is it. It's in social and political matter. And of course, Everybody knows this. When you have a society which is organized in these terms, according to these standards, the main result is always that huge numbers of people are excluded from this society. They are excluded from the wealth. They are excluded from the services. They are excluded from participation. So this concept and this practice produces mass exclusion. And this exclusion finds two different answers in different societies and under different circumstances. One is populism. Populism means counter elites attack the ruling neoliberal elites, promise people to look after their needs, to do something for them, maybe work or something like in the US when Trump said, we will bring you work and we will bring you income. But they do not create comprehensive social security systems. And they do also not change the society, control the markets and all this. And they will not do much 
in order to bring about equal freedom, namely justice. Populism is one answer. Populism is the answer which preserves the prevailing situation, the prevailing circumstances, free markets, rich people, big degrees of inequality and everything, but in some way or the other succeeds in getting mass support, like Trump's. The other answer is social democracy. Social democracy is the real answer, you could say, because social democracy changes the social structures, the social conditions, so that inclusion, include people on equal terms, is made possible. Okay. So far, we had mainly neoliberal globalization in the world. Neoliberal, neoliberal globalization means the markets are dominant and everything that corrects the markets, that frames the markets, that regulates markets, has played a very, very small role. And the neoliberal globalization, the glo globalization led by markets, market mechanisms, market logics, produces two different groups in the society, splits the societies up. There are winners of this. These are the new professional middle classes, those who work in the money sector, communication sector, trade, um, electronics, computer, and all this. This is the new middle class. They develop a cosmopolitan view. We have the problem here in Europe, in, in the United States, where we do. These are small classes living in the big cities. They say, okay, we profit from this way of globalization. We find it very good. We should continue. We are cosmopolitans. Tear down all the frontiers and goods, services, everything, migrants, everything, the money can walk around the globe without without frontiers, without any limits, without any regulation. So they are against regulation. They are against welfare states. They are against everything which is at the heart of the social democratic groups because they profit from it. These are the cosmopolitans. Cosmopolitanism is a difficult, difficult term. Maybe we come back to it. The losers, of course, are the old small middle class people maybe skilled workers, maybe small enterprise, and the unskilled workers everywhere, because both are not mobile. They do not profit from this neoliberal globalization. Their situation is deteriorated by this neoliberal globalization, and therefore they ask for protection. They are sometimes called communitarians because they say what we want is the protection of our national community. If they say we want the protection of our ethnical community, we call them identity politicians because then the community is the protector of identity politics. If they say, okay, the nation in its pluralist structure should protect us, then they are called communitarians. But this is a little bit a difficult term, we can come back to it. My main message is here, we have these two different classes. And uh, here I tell you one thing, I do not understand the situation in your different countries very well, but I need to say, in Europe, this new split, this new cleavage, this new basic conflict is a very big problem for social democratic parties, because some of the voters and of the members of the Social Democratic parties, so let's say like teachers, like people working in the cultural sector, like some people working in the computer business as well. They are cosmopolitans in the sense, open the doors is their slogan. And many of the members and workers of the Social Democratic parties are losers of this neoliberal globalization communitarians in that sense. Their slogan is close the doors and help us to ameliorate our situation. So this is a 
big interesting cleavage. The situation which I told you now, this neoliberal globalization and the new split between the uh, winners of this neoliberal globalization, the cosmopolitans, and the losers called communitarians, both long time, part, part of both, long time supporters of social democracy. The, the question is here, how shall we answer this challenge? And there are two possible answers. One is class politics, social democracy, change the social situation, include all by a good and, and efficient welfare state and participation system, social real inclusion by delivering social goods to all these who suffer under the situation. And the other answer is identity politics, namely using the sentiments, the protest in the lower classes against this for identity politics. And we have two versions of identity politics. One is populism. This is the type of, in Europe, Hungary, in Brazil, you have it, in the US, you have it in many countries. In India, you have it too. In India, it's more fundamental populism. That means we create a new elite here. The new elite will look after the people in some way, but we have to find to fight against certain enemies who are disturbing the sufficient delivery of goods and services for the people. And you have the hard version of identity politics, which is fundamentalism. This is what happens in India. Fundamentalism says, only those who belong to the same ethnicity are entitled to full services, to full protection. The others not. The others are our enemies. This leads to what I call here a symbolic inclusion. We are included, but only in symbolic terms. We are all Indians, all Muslims, or all Hindus, or in America, more or less. We are white Americans. And uh, in, in, in Hungary, we are true, real Hungarians. So this symbolic inclusion is very popular today. And this is the basis of identity politics, our common identity, not our common social situation, is the main platform for integration. Identity politicians integrate you symbolically. Now we are the white Americans, we are the elite, we are the real Hungarians, but they do not give you a fully fledged welfare state and a system of participation. So the first, the class politics looks for real social inclusion via social goods. And the identity politics, the other alternative worldwide looks for symbolic inclusion by giving you symbolic uh, uh, goods, namely belonging. You belong to the good, to the leading, to the dominant community. So, this is the situation, one should understand this. Populist deglobalization means for most of the populists, particularly Trump, but others too, the main answer is if globalization brought about a situation where the workers, the lower class in the society suffer, then we must deglobalize. We must come back to the nation state. Make America great again. Hungary about everything. India, the real Indians, are the ones who must determine our future. Deglobalization is the main slogan and the main danger. Nationalism, authoritarianism, leader-centered, elite-friendly, pro-market. They say if the markets are globalized. This is enough. We don't need any political globalization. Normally, they also pursue scapegoat politics. They have also a scapegoat. Most of the time, the refugees, the refugees or some other nations, the faux friend attitudes, the foes can be foreigners, non believers, ethnic minorities, anti liberal, anti mass media, cultural civil war, selective social benefits. They give people, like in Poland or Hungary, 
certain social benefits, particularly in these countries for families, because they have a special family ideology, but not a rights-based welfare populist deglobalization. I come back to this later. And I think deglobalization cannot be a social democratic answer to the situation because almost all the major problems, the international markets, the international diseases, like the pandemic, which we have now, the environmental protection, climate change, these are all challenges that can only be overcome, that can only be mastered by global cooperation. So now this contains all the answers in a very comprehensive manner. If you compare libertarian or neoliberal democracy and social democracy, you find everything to make clear what the differences are here on this slide. One thing is the, the starting point for all you. In, in the left upper uh, echelon here, you see UN 1966 basic rights. This means in the time after the Second World War, the ILO, the International Labour Organization, was very strong. And the International Labour Organization always was dominated by representatives from the trade unions and also from the social democratic governments. And this uh, ILO was very much engaged in drafting the basic rights covenant of 1966. It's very interesting to see that it's a covenant. I didn't write this word covenant. A covenant means it's not just a call for, it's not just a declaration, like the 1948 Declaration on Human Rights. This means we, we declare everybody should do something in favor of human rights. You should, it's a call, but this is a covenant. Covenant is an international treaty that establishes international law. And in this covenant of 1966, and you should, should keep this in mind, because this is the very heart of what we understand by yes. social democracy today. Pardon? There you have five categories of basic rights. And these five categories of basic rights contain everything that needs to be underlined when you explain what social democracy is. There are civil basic rights, like uh, the right to organize yourself, the right to express your opinion in the public, the right of free press, all these things. Civil basic rights, you have political basic rights, the right to form a government, the right to elect your government, the right to build political parties, and the right of course, of election, these things. Both together, the civil and the political rights sometimes are called the liberal basic rights. Because if you accept these two groups of rights, of basic rights only and nothing else, you are liberal. In the US, President Reagan said, only civil and political basic rights are real basic rights, nothing else. But then, in this covenant of basic rights, it is said very clearly in the preambular, if you have only the civil and political basic rights, it means for large parts of the population, each society is still, that they do not enjoy freedom and self-determination because they do not have the resources. We need to guarantee the social resources in order to make abstract declarations of freedom real for everybody to make them real, to give them a use value instead of merely an abstract right. And therefore, in this preamble, it is that only a person who enjoys, in addition to the civil and political basic rights, social and economic basic rights, only such a person is free in real terms. Then there are also cultural rights, of course. I come to this maybe a little later on. So, and then the difference between civil and political rights only 
which is the left column in white, makes a liberal or libertarian out of you. If you accept all the five categories, civil and political, plus social and economic, as it is meant in this covenant, it makes you a social democrat. It makes you a social democrat. And if you go through this, you see left at the top, we say state. The difference is state. Yes, right. What is the idea of the state? The liberals say the best state is a market state. A state who keeps the economic markets running. And whatever a state does in, a tish, in addition to that is potentially a problem. The minimal state who just keeps the markets running. This is the ideal state for the liberals. And of course, this means you need police so that the property is protected, security, physical security, property security, but nothing else. The social democratic position social and economic rights says here, no, in order to make everybody free and give everybody the opportunity to, to enjoy its rights, the state must be a social state. A social state means a state in which every individual enjoys the right of social citizenship. Social citizenship, that means all the basic risks must be insured. There must be protection against all the basic risks. I come to this a little later. You need, when you have children, you need support. You need free schooling. You need free education. And you need economic democracy. The state must organize the economy in such a manner that you still are free when you are in work life. In work life, that means you participate, workers' participation works councils, trade union rights and all this. So a social state, a social welfare state and economic democracy. If you have these two things and the state's duty is to organize these two things. You have the idea of a state, an active state as it is meant by social democrats. Market, the liberal position says, we need a liberal market, not regulated, as little state intervention as possible. And the market is a aim in itself because markets mean freedom. And they are right, of course, for the owners of the means of production, unharmed, unregulated markets mean freedom. It's a means in itself for them. But in the social position, in the social democratic position, markets are instruments that possibly can make an economy more productive, more flexible, but it also creates a lot of problems. A market left alone, the logic of markets, creates tremendous amounts of inequality, also environmental destruction, economic crisis, cyclical economic crisis, concentration, unemployment, everything. So for the social democratic position, a market is an instrument like a knife it depends what you do with it. You can kill somebody with a knife and you can prepare a meal. In order to make the market serve the needs and the interests of the society, the markets must always be regulated and they must be always embedded in social and political regulations. So the, 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 the general term, what we use here is to say, Markets can be good servants, but they're always bad, poor masters. Never allow markets to be masters in a society. Assure that they are just servants. And then, of course, this leads to a welfare state. The liberals or libertarians, they offer a residual welfare state. If people are absolutely poor, they must be given something. If people are dying, they must give... Uh, uh, some help, sorry. but uh, social democratic idea is we need a rights-based comprehensive welfare state, which means social citizenship, 
guarantees everybody a right, a basic right, a citizen's right, that all the necessary social services to make a self-determined life possible are there, are available for everybody, rights-based. We have a right for this because we are citizens. Mutually, we guarantee each other these social rights. Comprehensive means everybody must have guarantees against all the risks. These two alls are meant when we use the term comprehensive. This means education, that means work, if no work, unemployment, uh, aid, pensions, health services. This must be available. And this is the, one of the main tasks of the main objectives of the state, even more than keeping markets running the realization of these basic rights, of these basic rights are the obligation of the state. Governance, which are the main instruments to govern a society, liberals, libertarians would say the market, they would say if you extend the market to as many fields of social life as possible, this is always the best solution. And uh, social democrats, you know, we have three instruments or three modes of governance. The state is a mode. The state does things through power, force, legislation, the market, buying, selling, offering services, and the civil society engagement activities. And only the interaction of these three modes of governance, state, power, market, money, civil society, solidarity, only the interaction of these three modes of governance will make sure that a society is well governed. Economic property, the main idea of the libertarians always have been economic property is an absolute value. Most of them, United States, 150 years back in Europe say, the most important thing to guarantee the freedom of the individual is to guarantee economic property. Because when you have economic property, it allows you to act freely. And then the answer of the social democrats is yes. And those who do not have economic property must have a protection against the power, which is also one of the, of the skills of economic property. And therefore the economic property must be socially limited and it must be embedded. This embedding and limitation is what the welfare state basically means and in the economy, democracy. The economic property is possible as an instrument. It is limited. So in the German constitution, we have a wonderful regulation that says economic private property is guaranteed, but only in so far as it serves the interests of the community as well. And if it doesn't do so, it can be socialized. This is in the German constitution. And then of course, the last field globalization, as I said in the beginning, for a libertarian, a radical liberal in the um, European sense, a libertarian in the American sense, in the European sense, a liberal. Markets are the best way to organize globalization. And for the social democrats, political global governance. We need worldwide regulations of the markets, compensations for the problems markets create and all this. We need a global political cooperation, multilateral worldwide. So this, if you take this tableau here, you have everything, what you need to understand what social democracy is in opposition to libertarianism in American terms or liberal positions in European terms, I don't know what in your countries the use of these words is. So this is something. And because this is much already, we could have, we could have a, a, a stop here and discuss this or should we continue? If you want to understand the European welfare state, because many people worldwide think and say, Europe is the best organized most well-equipped sphere in the world with relation to welfare state issues, which is true, I think. But 
The problem is, if you take, for instance, the European Union, in the, Europe, the European Union as such is not a welfare state, but the 27, 26 countries who are the member states, they all have their own welfare states, and the European Union tries to coordinate these welfare states and to introduce a minimum level, which they all should respect, some minimal services, which they all should deliver. And if you organize a welfare state, you need to answer six questions, which are answered in different manners in different European welfare states. Basically, but I do not go into the details here. In Europe, we have basically three different kinds of welfare states. We have the right away social democratic welfare state only in the Scandinavian countries. We have what is called a liberal welfare state in the Anglo-Saxon countries. And we have the, what we call the continental or the conservative welfare states in countries like Netherlands, like France, like Germany. These are, they, are, they all have the objective to protect their people. But here you have these three different types of welfare states. They are all welfare states. They all claim to deliver the necessary basic services and protection to everybody, but they do it in very different ways at very different levels and in very different degrees of generosity. And to give you a few examples, the philosophy, the objective, the social democratic welfare state, left column, income maintenance, full social inclusion, basic income. That means if you are unemployed, if you are sick, it's the task of the welfare state that your income is maintained, full income maintenance, full social inclusion. Social inclusion means you should have enough resources to participate fully in social life. This is what social inclusion means. Social inclusion is a very, very interesting term, which we always use also in the European Union. Inclusion means I can participate fully. Exclusion, of course, I'm in a minority group at the margins of the society. I cannot do many things which others do. My children cannot do many things which others do. Full social inclusion, basic income. You always must have a basic income. The conservative welfare state, as different to this, has the objective status maintenance. Status maintenance means if you had a big income, you should remain to have this big income if you are unemployed. If you had a small income, your small income should be uh, guaranteed. Partial social inclusion, you are included in so far as you never fall down into poverty, but not inclusion at the full level. And in the liberal welfare states like Great, Great, Britannia, Great Britannia, poverty protection. Those who are poor get something, not to be poor anymore, but not more than that. Very different. Benefits here. Social democratic welfare state, generous. You always have enough, you are given enough. Earnings related. When you had a work life with high income, you will have a high pension. If you had a work life with a low income, you will have a low pension. And liberal flat rate minimum, and a low minimum guarantee flat rate for everybody, those who are poor or at the margins. And here, most important here, eligibility. Eligibility means who is entitled, who is entitled, entitlements. Social democratic welfare state, citizenship. This is the idea of a social citizenship. When you are a citizen of this state, you enjoy the right of social citizenship. This alone entitles you to get all the benefits and all the guarantees of the welfare state. Conservative contribution record. If you have paid your contributions to the compulsory welfare insurance systems, then according to the amount of fees you paid, you get something. 
contribution record of the employees. It, this is the basic source of eligibility and liberal citizen need. If you are a citizen and you are in need, then you get the minimum. These are the main differences. Let me go to its coverage. Social democratic means all risks at all time are covered. All risks at different levels are covered, conservative and liberal poverty risks are covered. Financing, the social democratic welfare state was characterized by mainly funding its benefits through taxes. This corresponds to the eligibility citizenship. As citizens, we guarantee each other social security, social protection, and we finance this through the taxes. The conservative welfare state was insurance related, and therefore contributions to the insurance was the main source of finance. And liberal, again, because it's the poverty, then the taxes again, but a lower degree are the main resources. You see the structure, how, is, how are these welfare states organized? Uh, now we, the, the social democratic uh, model is on the right side. For some reason, I don't know, we switched the sequence here. Right, Sweden, for instance. We have a national insurance, and the national insurance guarantees the comprehensive services. Generos generosity, very high. The other things, as I said. And what's most important is, in the Scandinavian countries, the education inequality is very low. There's a very high degree of education quality, uh, equality, of education equality. So we say, as social democrats, we would like to transform the negative globalization. Negative means here a globalization which is made alone by tearing down frontiers for the markets. This negative. The negative means tearing down something instead of building something. Positive means building something. So therefore, in an analytical sense, when we say, for instance, negative integration, that means bringing people together by tearing down frontiers. When we say positive integration, it means we bring people together by creating institutions, programs, and all these. This is the difference here. It's not in a moral sense, it's in an analytical sense, the difference between positive and negative. The market globalization is negative in both meanings, morally and analytically, because it's the result of tearing down frontiers alone. But we instead are in favor of a positive globalization. Multilateral political institutions. We would like to construe, to organize worldwide political multilateral, multilateral institutions, which are similar to the institutions that we built in the nation state in order to erect the structures of a social democracy. Something similar to this worldwide at a regional level, maybe ASEAN, European Union, SARC, and the like. And um, here I just mention a few. Multilateralism is the most important thing. The ILO, the International Labour Organization in Geneva, very, very important. The ILO was the agency who made it possible that we have social democracy in the covenant of basic rights. This is international law. And this is something for you, in which country ever you might be to say, we are here fighting for the social and economic basic rights that are guaranteed there, and our country has subscribed to that. This gives you a good position in the political campaign, I think. Fairer EU institutions, an economic council, maybe an economic security council, which coordinates and regulates international economic action, a new financial order, political systems of regional cooperation, as I said earlier. And when Willy Brandt was asked, what do you think 
is a democratic world society because they knew so they used this term for a long time. He said, a democratic world government or governance is when you have a, a lot of regional systems of political cooperation that cooperate with each other. And these regional systems of cooperation are the building blocks for a democratic world order. And of course, the active global civil society. So this is what I wanted to say. And I think, Makris, most of what was in your questions should be here in this. Maybe you detect something that is not in it, then we can add this. Okay, thank you. This was my presentation. So it is clear the United Nations Covenant is a global, a universal document that makes the social and economic basic rights universally valid. They are valid for each country. And I tell you that most of the countries of the world signed them, even the People's Republic of China. They said, we do not sign the liberal and political basic rights, but we sign the social and economic basic rights. So this is something which no government in the world would deny uh, verbally, if you ask them. This has, at the level of confession, 100% support. And it is also not dependent on the level of development. Because there's a very interesting example. In 1948, when Sri Lanka was independent, there was a socialist, a democratic socialist government, and they tried to do something to establish a social democracy. And they said, yes, we are a very poor country. We cannot start by building a comprehensive welfare state. But they did th three things. They said free schooling for everybody. They said free medical services for everybody and free food stamps, food marks for everybody, for those who need it. Though they established these three essential things, the education, the health service at a citizenship basis. All those who are citizens are entitled to these services. And then they developed it later, ethnical conflicts emerged and played a big role. So they were not in a continuous development in this. That means in each country. And if you live in a certain country, you must see what are the greatest needs in that country? What are the greatest deficits? And you start from these points. These are then immediately uh, convincing for everybody. For instance, here, poverty. Here, no schools. Here, lack of medical services. You start there and then also, of course, participation, free education. So for most, for most, the families and the young people, the free education is the most important thing. And so here, you can go to school without school fees. And if you're good, you can go to university without fees. Now in the US, the main point is in the US, the situation is when you have attended even a, an ordinary state university, not the private universities, and you passed your final exam. You start your professional work life with a debt of $100,000, $100,000 alone, which you have to repay. And therefore, Biden said yesterday, all state universities must offer free education. For the United States, this is a very, very crucial thing because these are millions of people who start their work life with this debt of 100,000. So then the list of the social and economic basic rights is broad. And where you start depends upon the special situation. And there's no country in the world in which you would say, yes, people are very poor here, but this is a European idea to fight against poverty. And therefore, we don't want this here. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Rawls plays a big role in the programmatic discussions of European and also American social democracy in that sense, that the degree of inequality in the 
primary income distribution should be limited through taxes. There's also something that Piketty says. And the measure, the yardstick for this should be only those relations of inequality can be and should be accepted that are necessary for the creation of overall wealth in a society is the difference principle of Rawls. And then utilitarian may be the idea that in addition to this, we need a yardstick of basic needs, or you would say this is Amartya Senmo. Each individual must have a sufficient commands over material resources in order to develop his or her capabilities and live a life in which his or her own capabilities are fully developed, are fully unfolded. So the combination of these two criteria is what we mean. Just primary income is one criteria and the other is full development of capability of all individuals. These together. And this is of course something that must be politically filled in a given situation. This is not just a, a mathematical uh, task or a mathematical model. This is something that needs to be settled in a political discussion in a given situation. But certain things, according to these basic rights, are clear, free, like free education, free health service and all this. It's clear, it's clear now. Uh, let me say one thing. In the first hundred years of our development, we used the word democratic socialism. But the word socialism can easily be used to discredit the project. And in most countries, a majority of people does not have a very positive idea about socialism because they think socialism is what happened in the Soviet communist imperium. And therefore we said it's clearer if we say social democracy. We do not lose anything, but the content, the content is still the same. Everything that we meant when we used the term democratic socialism is in the concept, in the concept of social democracy, and therefore we use this term. And in in in, in uh, addition to this, if you say we want to bring about socialism, then people attack you, and they say yes, this is what failed in Russia already. And then you have to explain that you mean something different, different, different then all the time is used for you to explain what you do not mean by this. But when you use the term social democracy, you can say, yes, we want a society in which these social and these economic basic rights are reality for all. And then you can list them, the social rights. I have a long list here also, and the economic rights. This makes it much easier. And then of course, you, what you can do is wherever you are, you join the forces who are working for this program that can be in terms of communication, publishing something, that can be in terms of science, of academic life, engaging in research projects and communication. This can be in terms of civil society, join initiatives who fight for a change of the situation, maybe in some villages or cities, this can be in terms of party membership of, or support of parties. So there are all these many opportunities. And the best way is, if you are in a specific country, you see where is the greatest deficit in the social economic basic value situation. And there you start and make a program. You see, I was very, very much surprised when I was in India. I ran into a very famous Indian socialist called Lohia. You know him? Lohia? Deva? Deva? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know him. I know him. You know him. So, and then he said, for a democratic socialist society, this was, I think, in 1958. 
He said, for a socialist society in India, we need 10 points. Point number one, public toilets for women. How, how is this possible? Public toilets for women? It's very clear because these women never had the opportunity to go to a, to to a toilet in public. And when they were in villages, they had to go to the fields. And there they met the guys who raped them and everything. So this was a basic factor of humanizing the life of half of the Indian society. This was a very good example, how you could start with the situation as it is. And then he had, of course, many other things like cooperatives. I'll give you a short example. The um, traditional workers' movement had a industrialist organization. The industries are the sources of our wealth. We all are working in industries. Our jobs are in the industries. So they only saw the industries. But then, when in the 1970s and 80s, the worldwide awareness that we are about to destroy the natural conditions of human life, a new ecologist, eco, ecologist movement came up. These were young people. These were people from cultural professions like teachers, artists, everything. And this ecological movement played a very big role. And then even many within the social democratic parties and the trade unions joined this movement. And we had a long discussion. And in this discussion, we said, yes, we have the basic, the basic values of our movement. The basic values, as I said earlier, are freedom, justice, solidarity. But these basic values, they all have a common presupposition, a common condition, namely an intact natural environment. Because if the natural environment is not intact, you cannot implement justice, freedom, solidarity. And therefore, all we do with respect to the basic rights must first be considered with respect to the effects for the um, environment. But today, what we say is, whatever we do in terms of jobs, in terms of growth, must be first considered under the prospect of what are the effects for nature, for the intact nature, natural conditions. So we try to have a synthesis between the social policies and the ecological policies. And therefore we say what we aim at is a social ecological market society, or also sometimes we say an ecological social democracy. So this is synthesis. In the programs and in the real policies, this plays a very, very important role because the sustainability, the long-term validity is guaranteed only if the projects are fully ecological. So the, I would say the ecological conditions are of equal value with the basic values. Let me first say, not all the parties who call themselves social democratic are really supporters of social democracy because some call themselves social democratic and are liberal in some European countries, even in some other countries. And social democracy is a project that is pursued in most social democratic parties, but also in other parties or other civil society organizations. If you ask for Marx. I'm a Marx expert. I did my doctoral dissertation, doctoral dissertation about Marx, on Marx. If you read the real Marx, the real Marx was a social democrat. He also talked about social democracy, the real Marx. And the real Marx had a con but the Marx which we find in communist parties or in Trotskyist parties or in other parties is an instrumentalized Marx. It's a Marx that is made up for special party interests. So that means the difference is 
We do not say socialism anymore because this makes us um, easier, vulnerable. This makes us vulnerable because people can say, then you are Marxists. You can be a social democrat in the way I explained it with a Marxian background. But you also can be a non-socialist or a communist or a Trotskyist with a Marxian background. Marx is ambiguous. Marx can be used as a source for very, very different ideologies. So it's unambiguous if you say we are social democrats in favor of social democracy. And if somebody comes and says, yes, but I'm a Marxist, then you have to ask what kind of Marxist are you? Are you a Marxist who supports social democracy? Or are you a Marxist who supports Trotsky? Or are you a Marxist who, who uh, protects or who supports Lenin? So you could, this is the problem. So Marx is not the dividing line because Marx is very ambivalent and has been used in the course of the 20th century for contradicting ideologies and practices. Therefore, our basic yardstick is social democracy. And then if somebody comes and says, yes, but I'm not, it's okay. Even our basic program, what we say is, let me put it that way. We call it ideological pluralism. Ideological pluralism. We say in the basic program, what is written here, the basic values, liberal, political, social, economic, basic rights together is our yardstick. How you justify this for yourself with a religion or with a humanist philosophy or with Marx, it's your personal option. You're free to do that. The main thing is we must converge. We must have a consensus when it comes to the real yardsticks. This is the basic thing. Thank you. For uh, of course, I recommend my own books first. <laughs> I have, I have a book. I have a book in Routledge, Routledge, uh, UK, Theory of Social Democracy, and most of what I said here is in this book. But then, in addition, the new book of Piketty, Thomas Piketty, the new book, which is called Capital and Ideology, Capital and Ideology, is a big book, a thick book, but this is a social democratic book. The concept that he develops how to overcome inequality is a social democratic concept. He first wrote a book about the capital, but now the new book, Capital and Ideology. In all the ideas, how to transform capitalism is absolutely social democratic, the whole program. This is a book that contains an analysis and also something about global cooperation. The other thing is all challenges of our time the inequality, the problems of the untamed markets, the ecology, the pandemic, the environment destruction are all problems which are only uh, to be overcome and solved, resolved with multilateral political cooperation, multilateralism. The multilateralism, which means global cooperation on an equal footing must be the main slogan and the main idea of social democrats for global cooperation. We cannot overcome the pandemic if there is no, particularly international cooperation, and particularly the ecological issue, but all the, also the others, migration, everything. So and this is the problem that Trump is against this. We are for deglobalization, but deglobalization worsens the problems instead of solving them. And therefore, we are the ones. And if we first do the multilateral cooperation at the regional level, these are things in the realm of experience, in the realm of the, of the life world of people. It makes it more comprehensible for people to say that this is good. These are our neighbors. We cooperate with our neighbors. We look for joint solutions with our neighbors. This lecture will be made available to all party schools and party academy two weeks from now through our YouTube channel so that our sister parties can also access the lecture of Professor Thomas Meyer today. 
So to everyone, thank you all for joining us. We will see you again soon in another Sokdem Asia activity. Stay safe, stay strong, and stay progressive. Good evening. Mm -hmm.